Chapter 26 World War II The World at War Again In his State of the Union address before Congress in January of 1941, President Roosevelt spoke of a future world order based on the essential human freedoms. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. And during the war, Roosevelt emphasized these freedoms as the Allies' war game aims. He compared them to the Ten Commandments and the Magna Carta and the Emancipation Proclamation. Extremely lofty goals, wonderful goals, but in reality, the United States is still a bit small townish. We're still a little bit naive. However, in 1943, Norman Rockwell uh, painted these paintings called the Four Freedoms. And in them, uh, the first one, he pictures an ordinary man speaking at a town meeting, saying what he wants to say, freedom of speech. The next one is members of different religious groups at prayer, any prayer that you want to say to any religion or God. The third one, freedom from fear, a family being over their children. And freedom from want, what's better than a Thanksgiving dinner with a mother and dad? serving this beautiful turkey. Now Rockwell presented these images of a very small town American life and that's pretty much what we were in the 1940s. But the United States changed dramatically during the war and many post-war trends and social movements had wartime origins. As with World War I but on a far greater scale there was mobilization during wartime and expanded the size and reach of the government. It stimulated the economy and our industrial output skyrocketed, unemployment disappeared, uh, demands for labor drew millions of women into the workforce and lured even more millions of migrants from rural America to the industrial cities of North and West. It kind of permanently changed the nation's social geography. It also gave us a new and lasting international role and reinforced the idea that America's security required the global dominance of American value and power. And government spending, oh my, unleashed rapid economic development in the South and West and laid the basis for the future development of the Sun Belt. It created a very close bond between big business and the military and the federal government and laid the groundwork for what President Dwight D. Eisenhower is going to call the Great Military Industrial Complex. The Four Freedoms produced a national unity that kind of obscured the divisions within our country. Divisions over whether free enterprise or the freedom of a global new deal would dominate after the war. Whether civil rights or white supremacy would define race relations. And would women return to the traditional roles in the household or would they enter the labor market? But sometimes my government does something that makes me so proud. And in the 1930s, <laughs> international affairs weren't being paid too much attention to by the general public. But FDR began to... Uh, do a little innovation and, and for instance in 1928 they have something called the Kellogg Brand Act. Well now Kellogg is our Secretary of State and Brand is the uh, opposite factor in France and they came up with an idea and they presented it to the nations and something like 61 nations signed on to it. So we've got to do something to prevent ever having another war. So they came up with this great idea. We're going to outlaw war. I told you we were a little bit naive. Well, that's wonderful, but there's no provisions for enforcement. It's like saying, <laughs> don't run with a pair of scissors in your hand, but what are you going to do if they do? You, there's nothing you can stop them. In trying to encourage trade, FDR actually recognized the Soviet Union and to hopefully do some trade. He repudiated the right to intervene with military force in the internal affairs of Latin American nations. Oh, wow. That's great. It's going to call a good neighbor policy. We withdrew our troops from Haiti and Nicaragua. We accepted Cuba's repeal of the Platt Amendment, which authorized us to intervene anytime we wanted to. But unfortunately, uh, like we still do today, sometimes we pick the wrong people to, shall we say, support. And Roosevelt recognized very undemocratic governments like that of Nicaragua with Somoza, Trujillo in the Dominican Republic, and Batista in Cuba. We still have that same problem. Now, war in Europe seems distant. But Hitler 
And when he had his admirers in this country, because he was so far much against communism, and there were businesses who traded with Germany, like Henry Ford. As a matter of fact, 80% of Japan's oil supply and her trucks and aircraft were all from the United States. It's an island country that has no natural resources. And the general consensus of opinion was that we had been tricked into the World War One. The only people that were going to benefit from it was the people who were making money selling arms. And that was no good. So we began to pass a series of neutrality acts. Like I said, Hitler's considered a threat, but we don't want to get involved. Uh, FDR, after a few debates in 1940, gets Congress to okay selling arms to Britain on a cash and carry basis. So this way we're not violating our neutrality because they're going to come over in their own ships and they're going to pay for the stuff and they're going to take them back. That's wonderful. And he also had called for a quarantine of the aggressors. And there's some very famous opponents of this, like Henry Ford, Father Coogan, Charles A. Lindbergh, you know, Lucky Lindy. Well, FDR runs for a third term and he had wins decisively. And he declares that we're going to be the great arsenal of democracy. And what exactly does that mean? Well, it, it means that uh, we'll sell arms to anyone who's fighting Nazis. Then he passed something called the Lend Lease Act, which it went through Congress okay, but, uh, <laughs> you know, one of the congressmen made a statement. He says, uh, You're lending ships and airplanes to England to fight the Nazis. Now, you, you're going to tell me they're going to give them back after the war? Isn't that kind of like lending somebody some chewing gum? Do you really want it back when they're through with it? <laughs> and then he imposes sanctions on Japan for the invasion of China. Meanwhile, Stalin does something that we historians had a terrible time understanding. He signs a non-aggression pact with Hitler. The traditional enemy of Russia is Germany. And I'm sure that someone had told him about that book that Hitler had written called Mein Kampf, which explained how they plan on taking over Russia and making slaves of the Russians and taking all the best land, giving to Germans. But he just didn't seem to quite understand it. Uh, Hitler had a great idea. This keeps Russia off his back so he can concentrate on the uh, Western Front. But Hitler, well, he, he gained some land. He got a warm water port. And I, I personally think that he probably believed if Hitler wasn't telling the truth that Russia was big enough to defend herself. Meanwhile, Hitler invades Poland. And oh, folks, that was a disaster because the Polish army had never been mechanized. And we have seen films of the Polish infantry riding horses with their little pointy hats and spears to attack German tanks. Well, of course, they were decimated. They, they were just mowed down. You know, they, they couldn't do it. But when she invades Poland, France and England, who have a uh, treaty with Poland, they declared war on Germany. Then in 1940, they, uh, well, the winter of 39-40, they called it kind of the uh, no man's war. There was, it seemed like nothing was going on. They had been taken Belgium, and they had taken Germany, and they'd taken, the, uh, not Germany, they'd taken Belgium, they'd taken the Netherlands, and they'd taken Poland, and things kind of settled down for the winter. So the French, who had made this great big old line of fortresses across France, from one side to the other, uh, they said the, the Germans couldn't get past them. There were bunkers. It's called the Maginot Line. Well, it didn't seem to work. The Germans just went around them. Now, I have seen films taken of the uh, Germans. Yeah, you know, it's June. It's in France. It's supposed to be springtime. You're supposed to be having flowers and street musicians and music and birds singing. But in June of 1940, there was nothing. Uh, you look at the films, and standing along the street are old men and old women, and maybe a few soldiers with crutches or legs missing. And they're all looking to their left. And you see tears running down their face. You don't see any flags flying. And all of a sudden, you see the great German military coming in. And, and the bills of their hats were so shiny from being polished that you could use them as mirrors. The men walking in the goose step, and there was a beautiful parade, and all the tanks, and nothing. Absolutely nothing. And you know, you hear about the French have always been so great at well, demonstrations and burning tires and nothing. 
Even the Germans were surprised at how easily they took Paris. Well, actually, a deal had been struck, yes. Uh, if you don't surrender your city to us, we'll destroy it. And they'd already seen the effects of what they had done in Poland and Belgium and the Netherlands. If you resisted, you would stand up against the wall and shot, and your beautiful town was destroyed. And they didn't want the beautiful things in France to be destroyed, especially in Paris. I mean, Notre Dame, the Champs Elysees, I mean, all those, you didn't want that to happen. So you surrendered. So now Hitler is dominating Europe and North Africa. Wow. And his generals are telling him, now's the time, cross the English Channel and take England. And Hitler says, well, he kind of admires the British. I mean, they're the closest thing to the Aryan race you can think of. And he, he kind of looks on them, you know, it was the Romans who really civilized them. He goes, let's just give the men a rest and let's just wait a few minutes. I'm sure the prime minister will be agreeable to talk to us. And Germany and Italy and Japan signed an agreement known as the Axis. Well, by the time Hitler gets word over to England, and they've got a new prime minister called Winston Churchill. And he says, no, we're not going to surrender. We're going to fight you in the beaches if we have to. And he just talks and he jaws. He's shaking. We'll fight you in the streets. We will never give up. Well, Hitler was furious. So he sends his air force over. It's called the Blitz. Now, Blitz is a German word meaning lightning. And it, it's just so fast. And they were bombing, bombing, bombing. And they would have these uh, wardens and big heavy curtains. So you, you had to turn all the lights out at night or put your curtains up. Because the Germans were bombing at night. And they were using the lights on the ground to, to bomb. Because they didn't have all the nice electronics that we've got today. It's called the Blitz, German word meaning lightning. Blitzkrieg means lightning war, because Krieg is a German word for war. We had sympathy. Oh, man. And we, we had radio stations that were people broadcasting this. Good afternoon, Mr. and Mrs. America. This is Walter Winchell broadcasting from downtown London. And you could hear the bombs drop, and you could hear people hollering. But no one ever get involved. The bombs devastated London. Now, yes. England had an air force, but the RAF, the Royal Air Force, was very small. And the men would go out on a run and have to come back and get in another plane while they're gassing up that plane. So it just wasn't that many pilots, but they were smaller and they were very agile. And finally, the blitz ends. But meanwhile, the London people were taking their children and sending them out to live on farms out of town. Because in the beginning, Hitler ordered just military places hit, but then he finally decided since the English weren't giving up, he'd bomb them all. Meanwhile, this is a picture of France surrendering, and it's with a great deal of gall. The military leaders, as you can see, are not happy. Europe's at war. And this is an example of the bombing in Britain. I mean, look at these buildings. It, it, they bomb, and the, the people would go into the shelters and into the uh, underground railroads. Not railroads, but underground, you know, the uh, underground trolleys or whatever you call them. And they'd come out and put out the fires and pick up as much as they could and go back to living. They're a very resilient race. But a quick review of what's going on in the 30s, because if you don't understand what's going on in the 30s, you don't really understand what's all going on. Japan, as I said, is a series of islands with no natural resources. And they invaded China, and China's government was kind of falling apart. There was a lot of warlords fighting, and they didn't have a good strong army. Nothing was unified. So it didn't take long for Japan to get, especially the area on the coast. They took the area called Manchuria, which is the uh, industrial manufacturing area. And, of course, we sent messages that, you know, this is not going to happen. This is not good. Uh, you got to stop this. And they came back and okay, if you don't like it, we'll just change the name. We no longer have Manchuria, we have Manchuko. And like this is going to make a difference. And something you've probably never heard of is the Rape of Manchang. It's a holocaust of China. And yet we don't hear about it. But the Japanese went in and they killed hundreds of thousands of civilians. They took the women and raped them, gang raped them. And some of them they took and sent to the uh, brothels of their army 
And it hadn't been too many years ago that finally a, a woman who was in her late 80s finally was returning to China, but she was so ashamed because she'd been forced to have relations with the Japanese soldiers. They would take babies and play ball with them. They would cut babies out of pregnant women's stomach. And all this, they, they tape, they, they take very, Japan tapes as good as records as Germany did. I mean, they kept records of it. 300,000 Japanese massacred in one town. Meanwhile, Hitler's launching his campaign to dominate Europe. He sends troops into the Rhineland, which, you know, violates the Versailles Treaty because he'd withdrawn from the uh, treaty anyway and rearmed Germany. And meanwhile, this little fella in Italy called Mussolini, who thought he was God's gift to everybody, he's kind of jealous. He wants to be on the world stage, but Italy hasn't really been, shall we say, um, settled that long. I don't mean settled with people living in it, but I mean the government settled and united. But he wants to be on the world stage, and she, Mussolini really admires Hitler. He wants to be an imperial power, so he looks at Africa, spots a little nation down there called Ethiopia, and he invades. Well, now the Ethiopians were not that well fortified, and it didn't take long for the Italian soldiers to take over. And of course, here in the States, we sent letters of protest, of course, you know, you shouldn't do that. That's a bad thing to do. No, no, no. And our African Americans here are just raising pain because not only is this have biblical implications, Ethiopia, but also you had a white country invading a black country. Meanwhile, General Francisco Franco overthrows the government of Spain in 1936. And Hitler and Mussolini both gave aid to him. And we sent letters of condemnation, but we did nothing else. Hitler then annexes Austria and Sudetman, which is a part of Czechoslovakia, but it's a German-speaking part of Czechoslovakia. Well, <laughs> Neville Chamberlain, who was the Prime Minister of England, goes over to talk to him about it. And I can just see it in my mind, that Neville Chamberlain, you know, the proper British diplomat, and Hitler, the little corporal soldier with his little mustache. Uh, he's, ah, oh, I'm not going to do any more. He said, all I want to do is unite all the German-speaking people. He says, I have no desire or plans on doing anything else. And Chamberlain took him at his word and came back to England, celebrating that we're going to have peace without war. Hitler is not going to go any further. And just within a few months, he takes over the entire country of Czechoslovakia. And we did nothing to oppose him. This is when FDR calls for a quarantine of the aggressors. It's, it's no good. But basically, we're doing the same thing uh, that England had done. We're following the appeasement. It, maybe if we're nice to Hitler and don't push him too much, maybe, maybe he will stop. Maybe he won't do Everybody is so terrified of another war. Meanwhile, because of our sanctions against the Japanese, on December the 7th, 1941, surprise attacks were bombed. The irony is, is the, as they were dropping the bombs, the word was being telecast to them, not telecast, but broadcast to them that there was a raid coming. Devastating. Initially, 2,000 American soldiers and sailors were killed. The military base was destroyed. The U.S. fleet was crippled, but it wasn't destroyed because the aircraft carriers were not in port. And, of course, on, then FDR declares war on Japan, saying, you know, December the 7th is a day that will live in infamy. And as soon as we declared war on Japan, Germany declares war on us. Now the U.S. is at war. Well, success is guaranteed, right? Nope. We're not really ready for action yet. And, and the sad thing is, the United States initially experienced a series of military disasters. And our initial losses were Japan takes Guam, the Philippines, and other Pacific Islands. And the Philippines, General Clark, Mark Clark, was there. And he had to be forced to leave. He didn't want to leave his troops. But it, they were just overwhelmed with Japanese soldiers, and they had to surrender. Seventy thousand prisoners were forced to walk sixty miles to their imprisonment camp, and the Japanese were not very nice about it. Uh, all of them were killed on the way, and some were buried alive just for the fun of it. 
It's called the Bataan Death March. Because more than 10,000 of that 70,000 died on the way there. It's a picture of them being forced to march. They weren't given anything to eat or drink during the whole march. Now, this is a picture of the Filipinos who tried to help the soldiers by giving them some water or help them. If they fell down, they'd be killed immediately. And these men were executed because they tried to help the captured soldiers. Things turn around a little bit. Something called the Battle of the Coral Sea was a series of naval battles uh, just off the coast of Australia. And here you can see, uh, here's Australia. Now, the real dark red is Japan had control of these before the war started, before we were bombed in Hawaii. The pink is basically what she took over afterwards. She's trying to take over Australia. And the Japanese Navy is <laughs> so far unbeaten. But in a series of battles between December 41 and May of 42, uh, between the Australians and the Americans, we got the upper hand. We won that battle. We stopped the Japanese invasion of Australia. It's called the Battle of the Coral Sea. And it was kind of the beginning of the turning point in the Pacific. Meanwhile, back over in the European theater, in between 42 and 43, British and American forces invade North Africa. Oh, by the way, uh, Japan, uh, not Japan, but Germany has attacked Russia. Mm, didn't they have a peace treaty? Sure they did, but we knew it wasn't going to last. And Stalin was begging for some help now. And we kept saying, we need a, you know, a front. We need to come on in, get, get this front going. And they decided that Africa was a place to go. Because in Africa, they had this really good German general called Rommel. Desert Fox. He was good. And they were taking over all of North Africa. And the problem with that, if they took all of North Africa, they were going to take over Egypt also, which meant the Suez Canal would be closed, which meant that any entry into the Mediterranean from the Arabian Sea was not going to happen. It just was not looking good, so we decided they had to go there. And this is, of course, where you learn about Patton, the great American general who was a tank commander. Uh, Rommel was a great tank commander. He was not a Nazi. He was a German soldier. And there was a lot of those folks, uh, the officers especially, who didn't agree with what Hitler was doing. And they were trying to be, they were great military men. But someone told, someone told, someone told, you know how that goes, that Rommel was involved in one of the plots to kill Hitler. So he was recalled to Germany. And while he was in Germany, in his home, um, he committed suicide, was the first report. The next report was that he'd been shot by an American bomber plane going overhead. Now, an American bomber plane don't get low enough to shoot, number one. And number two, you don't commit suicide by shooting yourself in the back of the head. But anyway, he's gone, and Patton, with his troops, and with Rommel gone, the leadership was decimated in the desert, so in 1943, the Germans had to surrender. And we're starting to gain some advantage in the Atlantic against some of those subs, those U-boats. So now what are we going to do? Well, Stalin again says, come on, we need a second front. Come on, come on, come on. And they said, well, we need to take care of Italy. It's just off the coast of Africa. We need to take care of it. So they invade Sicily and going to liberate Italy. Meanwhile, there's a People's Revolution, and Mussolini's overthrown, and he and his mistress both were killed by the people. But they were fighting for the next two years in Italy, because the Germans were still there. In June the 6th, 1944, in D-Day. 2,000, 200,000 American, British, and Canadians, led by General Eisenhower, invaded Normandy, with a million close behind. And I do have a YouTube at the uh, end of the lecture that for you to see that there's some actual war footage film. I was going to put it in the lecture, but if I put the YouTubes in the lecture, it makes the lecture so terribly, terribly long. And it didn't take long, although there was, <laughs> there was estimates from 2,500 to 5,000 American soldiers killed, injured, or missing in that Omaha Beach invasion. But they finally secured the beach and in August of 44, they liberated Paris. Oh, the men were so happy. I mean, the girls were so happy. We all were pictures of the French girls kissing the guys and giving them wine. Meanwhile, on the Eastern Front, in Stalingrad, the Germans and the Russians are fighting. Now, 
of the 14 million casualties by Germany, 10 million of them were killed on the Eastern Front. The Russians and the Germans were very brutal. And then you've got millions of the Polish and Russian civilians were also killed. And we didn't talk about the German invasion of Russia and why they tried to take Moscow. And something that we do not understand uh, or can't comprehend is Russians love their country so much they'll lay down their lives. And they were fighting without any guns, anything to keep the Germans from uh, taking over their country. Uh, civilians by the tens of thousands gave their lives and died. But finally, on May the 7th, 1945, victory in Europe, VE Day. And it's quite a celebration. It's one of those days that probably will ring true in history forever. May the 7th, 1945. It's right after that that Hitler does his thing. So, now we're going to concentrate on the Asian theater. Because after that Battle of the Coral Sea, uh, just off of Australia, the American Navy began what we call island hopping. They wanted to reclaim the islands that the Japanese had taken over in the Pacific. So with the war over in Europe, all attention turns to Japan. They began a systematic bombing of the Japanese city, predominantly focusing on Tokyo, which when they dropped these bombs that were fire bombs. And I lived in Japan for three and a half years, and even, it, although it was after the war, of course, uh, even 20 years after the war, the houses are, well, they're not built as sturdy as ours. And it didn't take much for them to burn it. And then we were making plans to invade in 1946. Well, rumors that Japan was close to surrender started surfacing. And Russia said that uh, she was going to declare war on Japan. And um, we tried to talk her out of it. You can keep Manchuria if you want to. Well, I, offering somebody something they already have is kind of foolish. She already had control of that. Oh, this is just a lot with, with the uh, different beaches. It wasn't just Omaha Beach. There was Gold Beach, Juno Beach, Sword Beach. Uh, there was a lot, millions of young men involved in that. Perhaps some of you have grandparents who were there. But at this war, you know, we got to gain the international role. And government spending to unleash economic developments in the South and West. Like I said, the Sun Belt is going to become very modernized across the South because of it. But this alliance between big business and militarized federal government, as General Eisenhower called it, the military-industrial complex. Between the late 40s, 50s, and 60s, and even into the 70s, you couldn't, anything you made or produced, had something to do with the military, whether it was meals to eat, uh, what do they call them, uh, MR, MRE, meals ready to eat, or K rations, or whatever you want to call them, or buttons for the uniform, or everybody was involved in doing something for the government. And it kind of reshaped our national boundaries, as I said, because uh, people are moving all over. But we did recognize the black contributions, but no matter how much we recognized them, we still put them in the category of a second class citizen. And of course, being afraid that we were going to be invaded by Japan, we took all these people who were actually born in this country, but their parents happened to be from Japan, and we called them Nisais, American-born Japanese. And we put them in an internment camp, which is a fancy name for, well, anyway, internment camps. But the idea is that four freedoms is supposed to produce national unity. And although we remember the World War II as the good war, because the nation was united behind our noble aims, I'm repeating myself, and I'm doing it on purpose. Is civil rights or white supremacy going to dominate? Are women, women going to be willing to return to the home and kitchen, or are they going to want to stay in the workforce? And just a bit away from your uh, text that didn't mention this, Bushuto. It's a Japanese code, which means you'd rather die than surrender. And believe me, the Japanese warrior, surrendering is an act of cowardice. The kamikaze, you probably heard the word. Kamikaze is a Japanese word meaning divine win. And when they saw that the war was not going for them, these men by the thousands volunteered to learn how to fly an airplane. And they would take them up, they call them zeros, 
with only enough fuel to get them to their target, and then they were to dive the plane into the target. At the Battle of Okinawa, there was more than a thousand of these young men in the kamikazes, and they sank 34 American ships and damaged 358 others. Their willingness to die in battle would result in huge American losses if we tried to invade, because you're going to be fighting on their homeland, and it's going to be an all-out war. It's not just going to be the men fighting, but the women are going to fight, the children are going to fight. You're going to be at a disadvantage because you don't know the landscape of the land, and Japan is very, very mountainous. So we had to rethink this invasion business. Meanwhile, Lieutenant, Girdle, Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle, he began his raids on Tokyo in, in uh, April of 42. He also was bombing a few other cities. Because that surprised the daylights out of them because they didn't think that we were close enough or we could get close enough to bomb them. But 16 B-25s, which is a bomber, launched from a, a carrier called the Hornet. But the captain of the Hornet was so afraid these ships were going to be sighted that he made the men launch an additional 400 miles out to sea. They were supposed to be within 400 miles, but he made them go from 800. And, of course, the planes didn't have the capability to have that much fuel, so none of the planes were returned. But we did get success in the bombing, and a lot of the men were captured. Some of them managed to get back. But this raid boosted our American morale because, I mean, we just lost the Philippines, so things were not looking good for us. But following that raid, Medulo, and the win in the Coral Sea, then there's the Battle of Midway Island, which we took. And a fleet of 80 Japanese ships are trying to lure the American fleet away from Hawaii, but we didn't bite for that one. Well, number one, we had managed to crack their codes, and we knew that they were coming. But in a three-day battle, we sunk four aircraft carriers, two cruisers, and three destroyers, and destroyed 200 planes. That's quite a hefty toll, and we damaged a lot of others. And this was the first real battle to see that Japan had totally lost. At the, the Battle of, um, off of Australia, they had been defeated, but they weren't destroyed. This was destroyed, and they're never going to fully recover. So you could say that the Battle of um, Midway was the turning point of the war in the Pacific. So now the Allies are on the offensive instead of on the defensive. A man called Admiral Nimitz was in charge of the Navy for the Pacific area, and he takes New Guinea in 44, and he gets Manila. We get the Philippines back and a few months later. But the Japanese on these islands are fighting furiously. They're not going to surrender. They hide in caves. And how are you going to get them out of a cave? You go in head first, they're going to shoot you. You can't go by and let them stay in the cave because they'll come out behind you and shoot you. So the Americans came up with the idea of flamethrowers. They used flamethrowers to shoot the flames into the caves, and that took care of the problem. But, you know, there was a lot of changes. The wartime causes changes in your American society because of the mobilization. Hundreds of thousands of people are <laughs> getting mobilized to go into the military. And in any war, the government grows and takes more responsibility. The economy was stimulated like you would not believe. Industrial output skyrocketed. Unemployment totally disappeared. The depression's over. If you don't have a job, it's because you don't want a job. You either have a job in a uh, military industrial complex or else you have a job in the military. And we got hundreds of thousands going from one side of the country to the other, going from the south. I mean, we again sent people to the south to recruit the African Americans to come to the north to take over jobs. Women, and of course we got wartime agencies, um, War Production Board, and this was a good one because they regulated the prices, Office of Manpower, Office of Price Administration, all these jobs, of course the uh, Public Information Manpower, the uh, Propaganda Office, and the federal workers jumped from one to four million, like I said, unemployment's gone, the government's building homes for some of these people to live close to where they work, the gross national product doubled. And the wartime spending was twice the amount we had spent in the past 50 years. And while all this is going on, our beloved President Roosevelt, our four-term elected president, dies. And this man that nobody knows, called Truman, his vice president, becomes the president. And this picture on the right is, of course, a picture of the parade, uh, funeral procession, not parade. 
So President Truman goes to Potsdam because there's a series of meetings between he and Stalin and uh, Churchill. Because it's obvious we're going to win the war and we need to know what to do after the war. And while he's there, he's told of the success of an atomic bomb testing. Well, he didn't know anything about it. He never heard of the Manhattan Project. Hmm. So he's thinking about it. And in his mind, it was just another bomb. It was just a bomb to, a little bit bigger than the one we had. Well, they knew that Japan was near surrender. But an invasion, no matter how you looked at it, is going to cost hundreds of thousands of American lives. So there were really only four ways to proceed with Japan. You could renegotiate the terms of surrender that you'd issued because we demanded that the emperor resign. You could let the emperor stay. You could invade Japan and it's going to cost hundreds of thousands of American lives. Or you could show them, you could demonstrate what an atomic bomb would do to them. Hopefully it would scare them enough that they would surrender. Or you could just drop the bomb. Well, Secretary of War Henry Simpson advised to drop. He said, after all, it's just another war weapon. And according to the diaries that uh, Truman kept, he had no problems about dropping it. It didn't matter what it would do as long as it would save American lives and end the war. And weather conditions determined it was going to be Hiroshima. And Colonel Doolittle, who'd already been doing some bombing of Tokyo, he flew his plane on August the 6th. And when he dropped that bomb, four square miles were incinerated immediately. 60,000 died instantly. Thousands died later. Two days later, because we still had heard no word from Japan, they dropped another bomb on Nagasaki. And after that bomb was dropped, the Japanese officials got hold of the uh, people involved and said, yeah, we want to surrender. There were no more bombs dropped. Only three had been made. Now, this is a picture of, a very historical picture. I mean, you know, August the 14th, 1945, the Japanese are signing a formal surrender on the battleship Missouri, and it's called VJ Day. But there's a little story behind this. Um, when the Navy first received word that the, the uh, surrender, the formal surrender was going to take place on their ship, they were kind of excited. I mean, you know, this is cool. And they got to thinking about it and thought, you know, this is a historic event. Maybe we need to learn a little bit more about how to do this. So they get out their books, so to speak, and check out. And you got to have this formal table, and you got to have this covering of the table, and all the, the uh, U.S. people got to be in their dress uniforms. And, well, they couldn't find a table, so they went down to the mess hall and got an old mess hall table. Well, you can't just put an old metal table out there and, you know, have the country surrender. It needs a curtain, or it needs a tablecloth. Well... Naval battleships don't carry tablecloths, but there was a nice red curtain, and you can't tell by looking, but it was a red curtain with the gold across the bottom, over some uh, stuff in the captain's quarters. They took that and they put it over the table. The only problem was it had a spot on it. So they fixed it so the spot was in a position where the papers were going to be laid. And as you can see, the Japanese is bending over signing, and it's not quite in the middle. It's a little bit to the side. So after the... Uh, Surrender, formal surrender, and you can see that the Japanese are very well dressed in their top hats, etc. They didn't, they chose not to wear kimonos for this ceremony. And all of our men are in their dress uniforms. And over to the right, you can see they're filming it. Very historic event. Afterwards, they put the table back in the mess hall and put the curtain back up in the captain's quarters and never gave another thought. About 15 years later, somebody started saying, what happened to that table that the Japanese surrendered on? That's, that's historical. That should go into the museum. It had been, been placed on another battleship, and they had to go find it. But it's in the uh, Naval Museum right now. Meanwhile, on, before the war was over, on the home front, well, there was a growth in women's employment. They had to fill the industrial jobs left for the men. And government and private ads... They celebrated the independent woman worker with images like Rosie the Riveter. There she is. And th this is another painting by Donald Rockwell. Uh, they're very self-reliant women. More than one-third of the civilian workforce and 350,000 women served in the military. Uh, okay, we've got women in there. And they're in an aircraft manufacturing. I think there was an aircraft manufacturing plant in Evansville, as a matter of fact. And they built ships, and uh, they worked on the auto workers' line. Uh, 
and they got professional pay. Same wages as men would get. The nice thing is, here's women in uniform. All the branches had their women. Most of them in the uh, women in the military were either in the medical profession or the office. The women kind of like that taste of freedom. I work in a man's job for man's pay. I know I did a uh, project in grad school on the plant there in town. It's now called MPD at the time. It was called um, Kenrad. They were doing government work and, and manufacturing and radar sites for the government. And 99.9% .9 of their employee force was women because most of the men were gone. And I had the dubious pleasure of interviewing the son of the man who had owned the plant, Mr. Berlou. Am I striking bells with you people? Uh, egotistical little character, if I must say so myself. Anyway, the I asked him why they employed so many women. He says that women had small hands, which made sense. I mean, they could do the work the others couldn't. And besides which, women would do what they were told. Ooh. Ooh. But the Kenrad at that time, as I said, they were doing a lot of uh, smelting, or what, I don't know what you call it, when you've got that little thing that you burn and put stuff together, the, the, the wires together, uh, the tubes and stuff. They couldn't have any air conditioning, and they didn't have any fans because they didn't want to cool off their instruments. And you'd work on piecework. You'd have a table of four to six women sitting around there doing things, and if one of the women went down, which happened quite frequently in the summertime, because when you came to work, you were given two towels, one wet and one dry. The wet one was to wear around your neck to keep you a little cool, and the dry one was to wipe the sweat. And if you passed out from the heat, they'd come get you and take you to the infirmary and bring you around, give you some salt tablets and water, and bring you back up. But meanwhile, your table sitting there doing nothing. I had the pleasure of interviewing about 60 of the women who had worked there during the war, and uh, of course, most of them are gone now. But the stories that they would tell about what they went through. But the biggest majority of them, they enjoyed making their own money and making their own decisions. But for the most part, they were all ready to get back home. But there were those who wanted to stay in the workforce. But employers saw women's work as just temporary uh, while the men are off fighting for their freedoms. It was not a woman's right or anything to do with her being independent. She, uh uh. And when the men came back, and I can understand this, when the men have been overseas fighting, when they come back, they get their old jobs back. It, you know, it makes sense, but it's, what about this poor woman who'd been working this job for three years? Propaganda began to pour out of the magazines that return home and the American way of life. We need a traditional family, and women enjoy being at home. And we've got all these nice new household appliances, and the man's going to go to work. Get thee back in the kitchen in the bedroom. Meanwhile, during the war, the government sold bonds, started taking income tax from our paychecks. We never got it. The bonds that were sold, uh, we didn't come out the same as we did in World War One <laughs> with a surplus, but it paid a great deal of the war. Uh, even your personalities in television, and, and not, we didn't have television, in movies, uh, Clark Gable, you know, Gene Autry, all those people, they were always getting, trying to get you to buy war bonds. And government and big business got, shall we say, a lot closer together. And we also had this thing called a dollar a year man. Uh, some of these men were so rich they didn't need to be paid, but the government can't hire a man and not pay him, so they paid him a token dollar a year. And you had a lot of good executives taking key positions. Our wartime production was gargantuan. I think I got it spelled right. It was huge. And of course, we had a lot of new inventions. The radar, that's one of the other things they worked on at Kenrad. They were just starting to investigate the jet engines and computers. Oh, the computers back in those days took up rooms and rooms. And the businessman's reputation was finally restored because it, it had been kind of down since, since we've had that crash back in 1929. Federal funding helped restore some of the old manufacturing areas. It helped build new ones. And, of course, on the West Coast, you got the steel and the aircraft manufacturing. In the South, you have a lot of military bases and uh, military-related factories and shipyards along the coast. Yes, it did raise the income in the South, but unfortunately, they're still mired deep in poverty because they just they refused to change. All industries were linked to the agriculture, such as cotton. Now, organized labor was 
not as powerful during the war as it had been before. Uh, we did have a three-sided agreement, the government, the business, and the union. And the government forced businesses to recognize the unions, and the unions promised not to strike. Well, of course they promised not to strike, because we tell them if you strike, go ahead and strike if you want to, but the government's going to take over. And that's what happened to the Kinrad. Uh, they refused to recognize the union, and the union walked out, and in comes the military. It was right after that that Mr. Berlue sold the Kinrad to General Electric. But by war's end, more than 15 million workers were in the Union. And Congress had just about had enough. We've got all these conservatives and the Democrats and Republicans are starting to work together and they're trying to dismantle the New Deal. They ended the CCC and the WPA. They said, it's controlled by leftists. And of course, the Office of Price Administration, the people didn't like the freeze on wages while corporate profits are soaring. Yeah, they are really going up gangbusters. And we did have some critics. Henry Wallace, a former New Dealer, and FDR as vice president for a while, he wanted to establish in the United States a century of common man for a march of freedom. He said the world should be governed by an international corporation and, and governments should humanize capitalism. Hmm. We should redistribute the economic resources to end hunger and illiteracy and poverty. What he wanted was a global New Deal. Now a man named Henry Luce, he published a magazine called The American Century and he said Americans should prepare to become dominant power in the world. Yeah, okay. Distribute to all peoples of the world the magnificent industrial products of America and the great American ideals like the love of freedom and liberty and free economic enterprise. The idea being that America had a mission to spread democracy and freedom. But America should be emulated, not impose American system. Emulate us. We're going to set a good example and lead by example, which is the only way really to lead properly. But both Wallace and Luce believed we should intervene in the world by spreading the abundance and be a model. But they ignored the other nations' views of post world world or word because. Unfortunately, we've had a problem several times because it's worked for us. We think it should work for everybody. And sometimes when you have a culture that's, you know, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years old and they've been doing things the same way and they don't want to change, it's working for them to leave them alone. The Congress had some post-war plans too. I guess they wanted to dismantle this New Deal. They wanted the economy to enable all Americans to enjoy freedom from want. Yes, that's, that's a good plan. I mean, we all want that. And they formed something called the National Resource Planning Board. Full employment and larger welfare state, according to the National Resource Planning. They emphasized economic security, a new bill of rights to guarantee education, health care, housing, and employment for all. Wow, what a dream, right? Wouldn't that be wonderful if nobody had to go hungry, everybody had a job? Oh, we'd be in heaven. The farmers and the labor and churches and the labor and all they all welcome those ideas. That sounds good. But we've got a bunch of liberals in Congress and, and they're starting to move away from government interference in the nation's economy. They're arguing the same old argument that spending is going to foster not going to foster economic growth. Uh uh. And Congress opposes their plans and starts cutting their funding and before long. And even though FDR had called for an economic bill of rights, uh the original Bill of Rights limited government to securing liberty. He wanted a minimum wage. He wanted medical care. He wanted education. He wanted housing. Hmm. All good democratic ideas. But the new VP, who was a very staunch party man and very conservative, Mr. Truman, he was also against it. And Congress never did enact that economic Bill of Rights. But they did enact something called the Serviceman's Readjustment Act of 1944, or as we know it, is the GI Bill. And to prevent what had happened, well, after the Revolutionary War, when they marched on New York to demand the promises that had been made to them and their back pay, and again in World War I, after World War I, when we had that uh, march on Washington, remember? We're not going to have that again, so we're going to offer this. Serviceman's Readjustment Act. We're going to 
offer low cost mortgages, low interest loans to start a business or just buy a farm. We're going to give you cash payments of, or money for tuition and living expenses to attend the college. Although, when you see the little YouTube ad about the how the uh, GI Bill changed American life, you're going to crack up. Uh, they get $500 for the tuition for a year and $50 a month living expenses. Well, folks, back in 1946, this was good money. You go to high school, you go to vocational school, you get one year of unemployment compensation. And it was available to every veteran who'd been on active duty during the war years for at least 90 days and had not been dishonorably discharged. Now, you've got this whether you've been in combat or not. If you've been in combat, you get more. It was a great plan, and I'm very proud of my government for doing it. As a matter of fact, my daughter, who wasn't in World War II, of course, but she was in, uh, in the military, and she managed to get part of her schooling through it. Uh, <laughs> it was... The rate of increase is not kept up. The government's still giving you a little bit. It, it did pay her babysitting while she was going to school, which was a big help. But Frederick Hayek, Australian-born economics, he's arguing, you know, all this government planning, it, it threatens the individual liberty and leads to a dictatorship. And I can see there is a point there if you don't have any incentive to do better. But uh, still, you know, sometimes you have to have the government step in to help out. Except the minimum wage concept and the maximum work hours. He equated conservatism with fascism, socialism, and the New Deal. And so many people who were against the New Deal kept claiming that we're going to socialism and fascism. The fight against the Nazi Empire discredited any ethnic and racial inequality, inequalities. And the government's arguing the U.S. is different from our enemies. We have committed to all Americans to enjoy the four freedoms. And war, of course, drew millions from the urban and ethnic neighborhoods and, and mixed them in the factories. Americanism means equality. Nazism means intolerance. And government in Hollywood depicted soldiers who placed national loyalty above ethnicity. Good. Bigotry, anti-Semitism, they're still around. But millions of ethnic Americans finally, for the first time, felt like they were Americans. But what are the non-whites? Now, before the war, the Southern blacks had definitely been segregated. Asians could not immigrate. Mexican Americans were deported. And the American Indians lived in poverty. And that's the way it was. And the war did bring some changes. 4.5 million Mexicans were recruited to work. And then there was the Zoot Suit Riots of 1943, which we'll get into in just a minute. Um, the American Indians served. Asian immigrant children, the Chinese, the Koreans, the Japanese, the Philippines, they all served in the military. As I told you before, the Japanese-born Americans were called Nisai. But unfortunately, about 110,000 were put in concentration camps. But we did have some in the military. And they were asked to buy war bonds and sign loyalty oaths. The African Americans. <laughs> FDR denounces racial superiority feelings. Meanwhile, Germany is still using propaganda, citing our segregation, and, and trying to get the black men to desert and go into their army. But when the blacks moved from the south to the north, they faced hostility. In Detroit in 1943, they had a terrible race riot. 34 were killed. It was a hate strike. The white workers didn't want to work beside the black workers. And in the South, lynching continues. And more than one million African Americans served in the military. Mostly non-combat, yes, and transportation. And the sad thing is they had trouble gaining GI Bill rights after the war. And not because the bill discriminated, it was the people who were administering the bill. So we begin to see a push for civil rights. And Mr. Philip Randolph's still around. And in July of 41, he was so upset about things, he called for a march on Washington. Well, it scared the bejesus out of Congress and FDR. That's the last thing they wanted. It, it, it's a good idea, but it's the wrong time. It, feelings are too bad. Excuse me. Patches. Randolph had formed a Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, and, and he declared discrimination was undemocratic. It was un-American. It was pro-Hitler. And FDR was kind of forced into it. He had a black cabinet. He, he was trying to help, but you've got to realize that the nation was a very racist nation. <laughs> 
but he did issue this Fair Employment Practices Commission, but no power to enforce, uh, but it did signal a shift in the policy. And actually, it was the first agency to try to do anything since Reconstruction. And it did help. But they also were pushing to have this non-discrimination clause in any government contracts. And by 1941, more than one million African Americans were working in the manufacturing area. But during the war years, the NAACP membership increased from 50,000 to 500,000. The Congress of Racial Equality was founded in 1942, or CORE, which we get more into that when you get into civil rights over in the 50s and 60s. The blacks had the idea, and uh, W.E.G. Du Bois also called for this, double victory. Victory over Japan and Germany, and victory over segregation in our country. It was a broad-based coalition with African Americans and Jewish groups trying to end discrimination in employment and housing, but the Jews were very much discriminated against also. But the South was terrified over this new militancy in the blacks. I mean, you got men coming back who are standing up straight, won't get off the sidewalks when you walk by, and they know how to use a gun. But in the West and the North, the liberals are calling for changes in race relationship. Now, an American dilemma, written by Gunther Migral, a Swedish social scientist, depicted Americans that we were affected by racism in law and politics and economics, social behavior and greed. Yes, we were. And it urged our government to ban racial discrimination. It sounds great, but it ain't going to happen. Passing a law is not going to do any good if you can't enforce it. It's like that Kellogg Grand Act back in 1927 or 28. Uh, it's a great idea, but if you can't enforce it, it's not worth the paper it's written on. You can ban racial discrimination, but until you get the people to, you have to start with your kids. Liberals wanted full employment, they wanted civil liberties, and a welfare state plus anti-lynching laws, which is not going to happen for another 20 years. But back to 1945, the Allied triumph was inevitable. Hillary tried to push the Allies back in the Battle of the Bulge, and it was one of the largest fought by the U.S. Army. We had over 70,000 casualties, and it almost succeeded. In March, the Allies pushed into Germany, and Hitler kills himself, and Soviet troops take Berlin. And we've got pictures, you can go on the internet and find them if you want to, of the, Jap of the German soldiers, not the German soldiers, the Russian soldiers and the American soldiers hugging each other when they meet. This is kind of a summary to round it up. In May the 8th, 1945, victory in Europe. Then the U.S. takes Guam and the Philippines. The FBI runs for a fourth term and dies on April the 12th, 1945. Harry Truman decides to use the bomb. And the bomb is Einstein, based on Einstein's theory of relativity. Called by product of uranium and, and man-made plutonium and bomb. He also warned FDR that the Nazis were trying to build, and they were. And that's when FDR launched the Manhattan Project, and the bomb was tested in July of 45, and a month later it was dropped on Japan. World War One, 90% of the deaths in the, were in the military. In World War Two, we had 20 million civilians killed. Nazis were killing all their enemies and Jews. When we bombed Dresden just to prove that we could do it, we killed 100,000. The bombings in Tokyo killed 100,000. And the American public is kind of upset with all these images of civilian suffering, but I have yet to see a military weapon or a gun that you can fire at someone and the bullet's going to know if this is a civilian or a military person. It's the weak, the women, the old who suffer in a war. But there was three big three conferences. In 1942, FDR, Churchill, and Stalin. 45 in Yalta, we got Truman now because uh, FDR is dead, and Churchill and Stalin. And in 1945, there was a meeting in New Hampshire where we replaced the British pound with the U.S. dollar as the international exchange. Oh, once upon a time, ladies and gentlemen, our money was the soundest money in the world, and everybody wanted American dollars, and the dollar went so far. We created a World Bank and an international monetary fund to help rebuild Europe. And our dominance of the world finance was recognized. 44, the United Nations was formed, and each member nation had a voice. The Security Council was six, rotating five permanent British, China, China, France, Soviet Union, and U.S. Each could have a veto power, and this is where we're going to get into the problem in 1950 with the Korean business. In June 1945, 51 countries adopted the United Nations Charter. 
has replaced the old League of Nations, of course. Only this time we joined. But after the war, war uh, you know, power is going to shift considerably. Only the U.S. and Russia were the only ones that had any power because, well, Russia wasn't as strong as we thought she was. We thought she was stronger than she was, and we didn't realize that she was in no shape to cause too much problem because she'd been practically devastated with the war herself. Britain and France are, well, they're just way down on the tube. Uh, we're the only country that didn't have any fighting in it. We didn't have any bombs dropped on our cities. And Soviet begins to occupy Eastern Europe. And when this starts to happen, it's going to spark something called the Cold War, which we're going to get into in the next chapter. But back in 1941, Churchill and FDR had gotten together and wrote something called the Atlantic Charter. Because you always make plans on the assumption you're going to win. And you also should have a contingency plan in case you don't win. But they were going to win. And after the, we won the war, uh, Germany's defeated. We're going to have free trade and self-government and a global New Deal. We're going to embrace this freedom from want and freedom from fear. But we're going to neglect freedom of speech and religion. But India, uh, Britain says, I don't know about this. I don't want to lose India. The Charter did inspire the colonized people to adopt a language and ideas of freedom and a national self-determination. And it's going to cause a lot of conflict and war in the near future because India is going to want to have her freedom from the Great Britain and all the people who still had colonial claims, they're going to want their freedom. So conflict and war, oh well it's going to be a cold war pretty close and then we have a hot war in Korea then we have a, actually the Vietnam was never a war, it was never declared war uh, neither was Korea, Korea was a police action but we're going to have conflicts and war in the near future. That being said, next time, post-World War II, thank you for listening.